name is Rich Schmidt, here with Jonathan Oberlander at J. Scott Sellers in Eugene, it's July 13, 2022. Well, I uh, grew up in Los Angeles. I was born in Minnesota um, and ended up going to school in San Diego. Um, didn't really know what I wanted to do, so I uh, studied business. I think anything you can do, you know, you're going to need business with. And so I thought that was a good deal. I kind of specialized in finance. Kind of thought about real estate development and, and wanted to get into that and, and construction. And construction jobs are really tough to f come by. And uh, I ended up doing, being a waiter and, you know, surfing and just kind of being kind of a beach bum. Um, and I met this lady one time and she's like, you know, my son, he, you know, the, he moved out of here about five years ago. It was the best thing he ever did because he was turning into a surf bum. And I'm thinking, looking at myself going, maybe I need to move. Maybe I should do something else. And because uh, it's just so easy. The weather's so nice. And uh, it's hard not to just like, you know, hang on the beach. So um, I uh, ended up taking a, my first job out of college was actually a sales job for Young's Market Company, which was a wine and spirits distributor. And a friend of mine's dad was the CFO and kind of got me the interview and, and uh, really enjoyed doing it. We had my own territory, so there's kind of an element of independence. And I just enjoyed getting out and talking to people. And uh, my first route was I-15 uh, in San Diego. There was not much there. I mean, it was Rancho Bernardo Poway. Mm -hmm. um, and now it's completely developed. Um, but my uh, my, I finally got promoted to a coastal territory, which was nice because then when I got done with my route at about noon, I'd started three in the morning, I could go surf. So <laughs> I brought it all back to square one. Um, but as part of that job, we would go to Napa and Sonoma and visit some of the wineries we, we represented. And so one of those visits, um, I met with a winemaker, I think his name was Phil Hurst, or, and uh, he was the winemaker at Fetzer. Uh, and so we went to Corbell and they have this really cool house that they entertain people at. There's a pool in the shape of a champagne bottle and it was just I'm like this is really awesome. But getting into this, the winery itself, I love the smell of the cellar. You know that kind of the, it's a little moldy but then there's fruit from the wine. Um, and when I talked with the winemaker there he says hey you know, I, you know you can actually get a degree in winemaking. I thought you had to be kind of born into it, your family had to have it, it's a generational thing because it kind of is. It's a, it's a major investment and usually it's multi-generational to actually make any money at it. Um, but when I found out there was a degree, I'm like, that's fantastic. So, uh, and it happened to be UC Davis, which my girlfriend at the time, Bonnie, was going to UC Davis for veterinary medicine. <laughs> so I ended up deciding to make a career change and told my family they thought I was insane. Um, I moved up and went to go talk to the guys at Davis and my business degree didn't have a lot of the prereqs that I needed in microbiology, lots of chemistry, uh, calculus, just a, a, a lot of science stuff that I didn't have. And I went to talk to the guys at Davis and they're basically like, hey, run along, you know? You don't have any of the qualifications to get into this program. It's this tough program. And so I'm like, run along, I wanted to get a master's degree. And, and I'm like, I'm spending good money. So I just started doing my prereqs, you know, all the stuff I needed to get into. And I found out about another program. It was at Cal State University Fresno. And I called up and I get this Spanish guy on the phone. Uh, turns out it was Dr. Carlos Muller and he was the director of the thing. He says, come down and talk to me. I went down and talked to him. At the time, it was the only university in the country that had its own bonded winery. So the students grew the grapes. We had a state vineyard, made the wine. We had sorting tables, tanks, forklifts, you know, and you show up and they give you rubber boots. And they're like, we're going to go make wine. And I'm like, this is exactly what I need, hands on, you know. And so I did that. Uh, while I was in Davis, I worked for a brewery there um, called Sudwerk, and I got to work on their bottling lines and kind of help make beer. Uh, actually got promoted to management, uh, which was great. And then I went down to Fresno, started all over again, started with another brewery, got to brew, work in a kind of a smaller brewery, got promoted to management um, while I was there. So I was kind of working full-time, student full-time. Um, but it was great because when I finally got my degree, uh, I ended up getting an assistant winemaking job right out of college, which normally you start as a hose dragger. You know, you start in the cellar and you kind of work your way up. But my wife and I, we loved to go to Monterey, which was uh, just a couple hours east of Fresno, and get kind of escape the heat of the Central Valley. And we loved it there. And one of the times we were there, there was a, uh, I think it was a wine enthusiast magazine, and the cover was this guy Ben Pond, who was this, uh, he was a Dutch billionaire. And uh, I'm just reading the article, very interesting. Come back, and there's a posting at the school for Bernardus Winery, for assistant winemaker. So I applied and somehow got the job. Uh, completely shocked. I guess because I had some management experience, I was going to be leading the cellar crew, um, had the hands-on winemaking. And um, I, I just remember the interview with the, the winemaker. He was Burgundian trained. Uh, his name is Don Blackburn. And I showed up in you know khaki pants, work boots, and then just like a nice kind of 
you know, plaid work, you know, kind of button down shirt. So it was kind of work, work minded, but still kind of clean cut. And my interview was, let's go take a walk. And this guy walked at about a five foot pace and he was fast. And they had, you know, a 50 acre state vineyard and he walked me through that entire vineyard, talking the entire time. He wanted to see if I could keep up, you know, could I, could I have a conversation? And I remember him asking me, you know, if I was stranded on a desert island, what wine would I have? And I told him Latosh because, you know, I love good Pinot. And he was a Pinot guy. And apparently, somehow between the walking and talking and the love of Pinot, um, we seemed to hit it off. And so I moved to Monterey and got to work for this beautiful winery. Um, they ended up building a really nice hotel in Carmel Valley. I thought it would actually be the place I worked forever because you know, we had a half a million dollar barrel budget every year and uh, it was just a, a great place to work. Uh, my wife, on the other hand, worked on the peninsula in Monterey and in the summer, things heat up in the, in the uh, Salinas Valley down around Paso Robles and all that air rises, that hot air, and it sucks in all that cold, uh, air from the Monterey Trench and it's freezing and it's foggy and so she was in the fog all day long and she hated it. I was working out at 85, 90 degrees when I came back into Carmel in the fog I was like I love this place you know <laughs> this is exactly what I need. So long story short we ended up my, my wife wanted to buy a practice uh, and she talked to this guy um, I said just send him a letter and she sent this guy a letter that says hey I want to buy your practice it was an all cap practice and she really thought she wanted to do that. So he's like, actually wrote her back and said, yeah, I'm thinking about selling. Let's go to dinner. So we go to dinner in Carmel, and it would happen to be a winemaker dinner. It was a Josh Jensen winemaker dinner. And so, and he had this, in his veterinary practice, he owned this little Victorian building, and downstairs, he and his wife ran the practice together. He was the doctor, she was the, um, the manager of the practice, and they had a wine cellar in their little shop. So we're talking wine, he loved wine, met Josh, which was, you know, great. Uh, he's a big Pinot guy, just passed away recently. Um, but uh, he says, let's, let's, let's come in, work for me, and we'll talk about selling the practice. So it's funny, because she always heard he was kind of a hothead, throw, throw things in surgery, all this other stuff. They got together, turns out they're two peas in a pod. They're both very like meticulous in how they do things, born on the same day, uh, and they really just kind of hit it off. And they were loving the practice, and everything was going great. And we were on our way to Yosemite for a, uh, a veterinary conference. We got a call that he wasn't feeling well. Um, and earlier that day, we uh, had just started to remodel on our house and they had ripped out the entire roof. And I had to catch this wild cat that my wife had brought home and kind of adopted. And I could not do it. And I finally corralled the cat. It turned around, bit me in my hand. And so my hand was the size of a softball as we were driving one handed to, to Yosemite. So when we had to turn around, I was like, you know, it's probably better. This is just, I mean, I'm feeling terrible. And well, we got back. It turns out uh, the doctor had had a heart attack in the clinic, hit the deck, age 50, never recovered. Mm. He was on a stress, uh, had a stress EKG the previous day. The doctor said, you're fine, go home. Mm. Uh, so he died. And so my wife immediately jumped in to try and keep the practice going. Um, we had two little girls, three and one. And she was doing about 100 hours a week. And the lady, his wife, was very upset. And she, you know, understandably, I mean, uh, she kept thinking that, you know, the thing was going to fail. And she kept asking how many clients would use, lose today to the staff. And the staff's like, none. They're love, loving body. And I think she didn't like that, that. And she kind of felt like my wife, I think, was kind of coming in trying to take advantage. And that was not the deal at all. But she made it really tough for my wife to work there. I says, you know what, we just don't need this stress. We've got two little kids. Um, let's, let's move. And so we looked at uh, Paso Robles, because her mom lives in San Luis, and we looked at Oregon, because her sister was up here. And all of a sudden, I saw this assistant winemaking job in Oregon. I said, hey, let's, uh, let me go interview for it. So I uh, went up, had an interview, came back, and we had gone to Chicago, I think, to visit her family. I, and I told an agent, to, let's sell the house, because I, thought, I figured we're just gonna move, regardless. I hadn't even got the job yet. We came back, the house had already had an offer on it. We hadn't even received confirmation that I got the job up here, which then came a couple days later, but we were already at escrow, and it was, so we were already like ready to move. Um, but I just remember coming up and interviewing, and I, I felt that Eugene was beautiful. I loved the winery. I ended up working at Sylvan Ridge. Uh, it's a beautiful winery out in the country. I remember walking on the bike path here in Eugene, and people would smile and wave at you, you know? And I'm from Los Angeles, you don't do that, you know? It's like, you know, you keep to your own, you know? And so it was just very friendly and welcoming, and was very excited to move. 
And my wife's from the East Coast, she's from Maryland. And so she didn't really like the brown in California and she loved the green up here. And so we came up one night and I wanted to show her the place before we, you know, to look for apartments. And we flew into Portland. It was 100 degrees at midnight when we got off the plane. And we ended up getting some hotel kind of by the airport, and I'm like, what are all these kids doing? I hear hanging by the front desk. I mean, late at the night, it's really weird. Turns out they were like prostitutes. You know, we was in a really <laughs> bad area. <laughs> so, I, you know, I'm like, I didn't know any better. So I, uh, but we came down to Eugene, really enjoyed it. Ended up finding an apartment right away that could take our cats and moved in. And then a month later, um, there was this really beautiful yellow house on the way out to Sylvan Ridge. I loved it. It's very kind of colonial and pillars, and it's just beautiful property. And I just every time I went by it, I was just in love with it. Well, we were looking at houses, and the agent says, "Well, I've got one that's not on the market yet. I want to show it to you." It was next door to that yellow house. You couldn't see it because there was a bunch of trees there, but beautiful house on acreage, uh, and it, it was north and south facing. It had a big three-quarter acre pond and a field that was perfect for planting grapes. I'm like, I love this. This is what I want to do. I convinced my wife to do it. She was not really on board, didn't have sidewalks. She wanted to push her double stroller. So she reluctantly agreed. And we bought the place before it ever even went on the market. Um, and my intent was to plant grapes. But before I knew it, I had two teenage daughters. And the winery was growing. And so I've never planted anything there. <laughs> so, But um, I did manage the vineyards at Sylvan Ridge with my own tractor. They have a, a five-acre plot there. So I did do some farming. And, and I, I enjoy that. I enjoyed driving the tractor component of it. Um, one of the things about winemaking is that it's you do different stuff every day. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you're doing bottling, or sometimes you're in the lab doing chemistry. Sometimes you're doing a winemaker dinner or a charity golf tournament, and, and so it's really it's varied, and it's one of the reasons why I love it because it's just you kind of live by the seasons too. You know, in the fall we're really busy with harvest, things quiet down. You can really kind of enjoy the holidays with your family. In January you relax and kind of recoup because of the you know the long days at harvest. And then spring time comes again, and it's like you get a new chance to start all over again. And it's just, it's fun, you know. And summers are great, too. I, one of the things I love about just being a winemaker and not a vineyard guy is the vineyard guys are super busy <laughs> in the summertime. <laughs> and honestly, you know, about the third time you whip yourself in the face with a grape cane, the romance goes out of it, you know, very fast. Um, but winemaking, you can go vacation. So, I mean, uh, you know, the distributors are really selling wine a lot. Uh, during the summer, and so you can go to Europe for a month, come back, and you know you're still making money, and you're playing during the best time of the year, and then you you know you relax in the winter. So um, I worked for Sylvan Ridge starting in 2004, and I worked there for 10 years. And actually, when I came up to interview with Liz Chambers, we went to lunch at the Excelsior here. Uh, she was a partner in that hotel and that restaurant. I said uh, I asked her if I could make some of my own wine at her place, you know. I wanted to do a small scale and that's kind of where I wanted to go. Ultimately it was doing my own brand. I said I'd like to work for you for 10 years and this will be the last place I work. And she said, okay. So I, uh, my old vineyard manager uh, used a rear sprayer who was based in Eugene. I'm like, this is so weird, you know, very strange. And so he had to come up and t take a sprayer in and when he did it, he brought up my four used barrels and my two rusty barrel racks and a couple of bins that the general manager Bernardus had given me. And I bought a little Pinot and started making wine in 2014. So I had some, some Paso Robles fruit that I brought up. I bought some Pinot in 04 and a little bit of straw. And that was kind of how I started with just uh, about 100 cases. And I did it kind of on the side while I made their wines. Uh, within about six months, I was promoted to winemaker at Sylvan Ridge. The other winemaker moved on. And by 2012, was made it to general manager. And uh, then in 2013, I actually went out on my own started my own winery and have been doing that full time ever since. Uh, but it was, uh, you know, and I, I still live out kind of by Sylvan Ridge. I'm kind of halfway between town, so my commute's about the same. It hasn't really changed. <laughs> I like living in the country, but being close to town, which is really nice. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a great career. I, this, is my, this will be my 26th vintage uh, making wines professionally. And I love it because I still learn stuff every, every day. Um, I visit other wineries, how people do things, um, learn more about the chemistry. The wine chemistry is extremely complex. I mean, there's probably 10,000 different compounds in a glass of wine, and we can measure a dozen of them easily. Um, I find it curious that you remove one of those, ethanol, you know, it's one of the smallest, and the entire thing just th goes to, you know what, it just, it, it's terrible. Um, something about that, that special little molecule holds all of the other uh, parts together and mm -hmm. makes it delicious. Mm -hmm. So.
Uh, so after all of that, I want to go back up a little bit to kind of the beginning of wine for you. Sure. Um, tell me about, uh, you, you learned wine from, the, from selling it first of all. So tell me about learning, understanding wine uh, in the early days. What were you, how were you learning about wine? What were you finding most exciting about wine? So I first learned about wine um, in college. and. I had grown up in, in an area called San Marino near South Pasadena, which is where Trader Joe's happened to be based. And so I remember going shopping at Trader Joe's, and I was in the wine department, and there's like these bottles of wine, and they were like $3.99 and $2.99. I'm like, is this right? I mean, and so I'm like, I have to try it. And so I would buy bottles of wine and then just taste them. And what I found was that I really liked the wines that were like 13% alcohol and higher. Didn't know why. That was like my one little you know, barometer that I could tell of why I like these wines. Well, as a winemaker, now I know that why that is. Well, more alcohol means that it had more sugar. So it was a riper year, and so the wines are softer. Also, that warmer year probably has less tannin or riper tannins, not as green. So again, the wines are softer and less acid because those warmer years, you lose that malic acid in the warm evenings and it kind of respires. And so that one little thing that I, that I noticed, there was a lot of reasons why that was there. And so that was where I really got exposed to wine through bull's blood or, or some of the other things that they had. And then I took the wine sales job and that's where I really got exposure to wine because we sold some wines. We were, I was actually on the spirits division um, but Brown Foreman, who was a, a big kind of whiskey peddler at the time, they have Jack Daniels and all that stuff, and Bacardi, they wanted, uh, those two particular big companies wanted their wines in their portfolio to be in the spirits division, because the wine book is huge, it's gigantic, and they wanted to get, they didn't want to get lost. But in the spirits book, you know, we only had a few things. There's a few Bacardi lines, but Bacardi owned Osti Spumante, and they had uh, uh, Bola wines, and... Um, um, some vermouths and things, and, and Brown Foreman had Fetzer and Corbell and all these other uh, big brands, and so we were able to focus on that. We actually took those wines from you know obscurity to really uh, big things. In fact, our San Diego sales team was uh, the top sales team in the state, uh, which normally Orange County was because it's you know that's a big a big market. We didn't have nearly the the money, but we were really good at merchandising, good at selling. Um, I remember I had this one Vaughn store. It was like a shrine to me. There was an entire end of Bacardi and an end of Fetzer, and then just all of these other spirits things around. You know, you walk in and everybody knew I owned that store. You know, <laughs> so. Um, but I enjoyed the sales part of it, and that's kind of how I got to try wines. One of the things we used to do as a sales reps is, you know, wines are periodically discontinued, and so the reps would go in and we would help the liquor clerk clean out his back room, things that are no longer on the shelf. The company had moved on, and so we'd find these wines. Well like the store that I was telling you about here. This was a high-end store in kind of Rancho Bernardo. And so there was Farniente in there and big Napa wines. And we'd go in there and they would let us clean it out. So we would mark them down to a dollar a bottle. So I loaded my entire cellar up with $100 bottles of Napa Cab for a dollar a bottle. And then Pinos. And so I had this really amazing wine cellar as a young person. And I would try them all. And so my wife was kind of into wine. She were kind of, you know, we were dating at the time. And, and because she was in Davis, it was about an hour from Napa. And we commuted long term for a while while she was in vet school. And I was still in San Diego. Did that for about two years. And so we'd go up to Tahoe or go to Napa and hang out. But we would try wines. And so all of a sudden she found, like, she loved Chardonnay. So all of a sudden I found that my my Chardonnay, my wine cellar was gone, you know. <laughs> then she got a taste for Pinot. Pinot's gone. Then she's like, Cab, Cab's gone. I'm like, right, that's it. We're, we're done. <laughs> but anyway. That's kind of how that went. But, you know, we got to taste a lot of good, really good wines. And, you know, um, people always ask what makes a great wine. And you just kind of know. You know, I, I remember there was a, it was an 87 George's De La Tour by BV. And it's just like it's a light bulb moment. I mean, you smell it, you taste it, and it's like, oh, I get it, you know. Um, it's just, every, it happens to everybody. And, you know, you just kind of remember those wines. It's just... People talk about, you know, I don't know, beer's never taken me to a place like that. I love beer, I made beer for a long time, and I have some really great beers, but a beer has never taken me to like a, a place where you're contemplative. You know, you're, it's kind of, I don't know, it does, wine does something to the mind where you just, uh, it helps you think and become introspective and, and you just kind of postulate things, you know? And so that's why I thought wine was interesting. And it's very, it's very different. You know, beer making is a lot like baking, I find. It's, it's very recipe driven, it's exact. I mean, you need this many pounds of malt of this particular malt and, you know, we want this many hops during the boil and this many finishing and, and it's a recipe to make it reproducible. Wine is a lot more like cooking. You know, you're, you have different raw ingredients every time and depending on, you know, where your tomatoes came from, your marinara is gonna be much, much different. And so it's kind of, you know, where the bees buzz, everything tastes differently. 
when you age wine in barrel, one of the magic things about barrels is the evaporative concentration. It's like doing a sauce reduction on a skillet. You know, you're either losing water or you're losing alcohol, but you're concentrating flavor in the barrel, and that's what you're doing as a chef on the stove. And so, it's really, you know, you're really kind of looking at what the ingredients give you each year, and then trying to make your best dish out of it, and with each wine. And I work with wines from all over the state. I go from Walla Walla through Washington, all the way down to Southern Oregon. I work with probably you know, eight or nine different AVAs. I don't have any vineyards. I just buy grapes. I work with farmers. I find where grapes are growing real well and bring them all back here and make the wines here, which is a good central spot for you know, distributing and everything else. So. But that's, that's the fun part of, for me about winemaking is that it's just so you never really know what you get. And every wine's different, especially in the Northwest, which is much different than California. You know, it's the weather really impacts the grapes. And so, you know, like this year, we're, we're a month behind. And it's, it's a real challenge. In 2011, it was our coldest growing year in 50 years. And everybody was freaking out. It's October and we had 17 bricks in our Pinot. You know, that's like where you pick for champagne. And I had several people call me up and this one guy, he was just freaking out. I said, hey, we're gonna pick this stuff, okay? We're not gonna leave it hang, we're gonna do it. And it was the first year I made a white Pinot. So I made a white Pinot, a rosé, and a red, all from fruit picked on the same day. It was amazing. The white Pinot didn't have an ounce of color because it was so cool. It had this beautiful grapefruity citrus. Um, the rosé had just a little bit of skin contact. And so it had this almost kind of strawberry character, a little bit softer, amazingly delicious. And the red Pinot, we you know we aged it in French oak and it had this beautiful spice. Now I had to add sugar to all of those, but I can open a bag of sugar. I can't open a bag of flavor and, and aroma. And so the thing about Oregon is when you have those cold years and you don't get sugar, the vines, they try and compensate for the lack of sugar because their entire goal is to get birds to eat their berries so that they can spread their seed. So if the sugar's not there, they gotta produce flavor, they gotta produce aroma, they gotta attract the birds. And that was what was going on. And so I can open a bag of sugar, no problem. And I did, and we made beautiful wine in 2011. Unfortunately, we got, you know, the press was all over that before the wines were ever even in bottle and we're throwing it under the bus mm -hmm. and now those wines are still lovely. And we had the same thing happened in 07. You know, the, the press like threw everybody under the bus and, you know, good winemakers can, we can adjust and it may be lighter, um, but it doesn't always have to look like Syrah, you know? Some of the best Pinot I've ever had looks like Rosé, mm -hmm. you know, extremely complex. And so you have to keep an open mind with wine and, you know, not throw the you know baby out with the bathwater. You know, keep trying, keep working, don't give up. You know, winemakers you have to. They're mostly optimists. You know, the glass is always half full. You know, and we don't give up. We're persistent, and you know you have to be in this business. So. So after learning wine from the sales side and, and being invested in that, what what uh, what did you understand about wine production at that point, and what was your first kind of wine production experience like? I didn't understand a lot about wine production until until university, and uh, it was I loved it. I mean, I loved you know it was it's, it's sticky and there's bees out there, but it's just it's so fun. I love that there's a physical act to it. You know, you're actually working with your hands. Um, one of my first jobs out of college, I worked for a uh, I met this guy, he was a plumber. And uh, he was actually, used to do lights and sound for Motley Crue and, and Black and Blue, but his uncle had passed away and his aunt asked him to come work this plumbing business. So in South Pasadena, there's a lot of big old homes and things. And so one of our customers was Father Mulca uh from Ash. He would come in in his old scrubs because he liked to do his own gardening. And David Lee Roth's dad, you know, Dr. Roth would come in because he liked to do his own thing too. It was like kind of relaxing for these guys. And you know, the Motley Crue bus would pull up and back and those guys would come in and you know, it was, it was funny. But uh, I learned how to, you know, refit an entire house in copper pipe. I installed the laundry room in my dad's house, you know, when my folks got separated. And so I learned a lot of that, but I still use all that stuff in 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 the winery. I mean, there's plumbing going to all your takes, all, all your hydraulic or your glycol lines. So I use the, the plumbing, I use the business, um, but I, I loved the production aspect of it. I loved, you know, smelling the wine during fermentation and just the act of pressing the grapes. And when I worked for the Burgundian winemaker in uh, Monterey, uh, he liked to press the caps with your feet. So we would, we would stand in these sterilizing solution on our legs and they would go up there with two by fours. We'd actually punch the caps. So in grapes, all of the color is in skins. And in France, they do it in you know, kind of chest high things. They like to wade through the, mm -hmm. the tanks because they can fill cold spots in the must and, and it kind of helps them gauge the fermentation and how it's moving along. And we would do it in, uh, you know, 
big eight ton fermenters. I mean, you could let go and the thing would hold you up in the air, uh, which is, but it's, you know, it's like a warm, bubbly cherry jacuzzi. It's, you know, it's 96 degrees and it's just, you know, it's a lot of fun. Uh, again, so it's, it's very um, sensory, uh, sensual. I mean, wine, you're, you're using your eyes in terms of looking at the wine and, and the ripeness of the fruit and the colors of the seeds. Um, you know, you listen to the barrels from malolactic fermentation. Obviously, you're tasting, you're smelling, and you're feeling, you know? Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a very sensual kind of occupation, and I, I enjoy it for that. Uh, so how, in the, on the production side, you mentioned kind of first experience at university, then you, you had kind of various experiences around California. How long did it take you to start to for, sort of feel comfortable with the work and with the kind of the annual cycle of, of the work you were doing? It's... Uh, it took a number of years. I mean, uh, you know, I, you get into the kind of the production mode, but you're constantly learning. I, I got a lot of expertise working with barrels and um, just kind of maintenance, maintenance of barrels. We had a lot of large oak tanks and uprights and kind of uh, maintaining those and kind of the impacts that they created on the wine, the different size of the vessel and how it, you know, accelerates or decelerates the aging of the wine. Um, so that was very interesting. In Oregon, because we have a little more inclement weather, or able to add sugar, as I mentioned earlier, uh, as a deal. You can't do that in California, and sometimes even in parts of California, you need to, and the wines would have definitely helped, um, but we weren't, we weren't able to do it. And so I like having that freedom. Uh, in, in Oregon, I think we have a great deal. In France, you can't add acid. Everybody has all these weird, obscure kind of rules, but the, you know, the, the more free you are, I think, for me, the goal is to make the best wine. And so you have to add a little acid one year, a little sugar one year. It doesn't matter. The, the goal should be make a great wine because that's the whole point of it, you know? Um, if you, why bottle something that's substandard? So, uh, but it, in Oregon, I really felt like I was able to have, do anything I wanted. I was just like, you know, it was like a kid in a candy store. And when I first moved up here, I was like, I'm, you know, I was working, we had a, a 50 acre Bordeaux vineyard because the, Mr. Pond, he was a Dutch vineyard, he loved French Bordeaux. So he planted all the Bordeaux varietals, about eight miles as the crow flies from Big Sur. And we had this big, beautiful pond, you know, with a one hole golf course. We'd go out there and shoot trap over the thing. And it was fantastic. But. I, uh, I love Pinot, and I was excited to move to Oregon for Pinot, but I was kind of going, man, I, you know, I still want to make Cab, I want to do all these other things, and all of a sudden I get here, and there's Cab in Oregon, and there's Syrah in Oregon, and there's all kinds of stuff, and in fact, Jay Scott, we've made Portland Monthly, they do this 50 best wines in Oregon. We made the list twice in 15 years, both times with Cabernet Sauvignon. So, you know, nobody knows anything about Oregon Cab, they've never heard of it, and it's fantastic, you know, it can be amazing. So. And I do Grenache, and we have 30 different varietals. We do Petite Syrah. We do things that nobody even would imagine you could do in Oregon. And I tell people that they still they still are blown away. It's like you do that in Oregon? Oh yeah, and get it ripe, and it's amazing. So that's one of the things I love is the just the variety here. There's so many microclimates from Medford, you know, out to Eastern Oregon and the Snake River. I mean, it's just you can make anything you want and make it well. So tell me about your first impressions of the Oregon wine industry when you moved up here. My first impressions of the Oregon wine industry were at a conference in Sacramento where we tasted Domaine Duran. And I, you know, I'm like, this is, you know, it's a French house, they moved to Oregon, these guys gotta be knowing what they're doing. And I was like, what's all the fuss about? This is kind of thin, kind of kind of acidic, you know, not, not impressing me, you know? Um, and so I was, I kind of had a different style that I was going for. You know, we worked with a lot of high-end Pinot, um, Rosella's Vineyard and Pizzoni, I mean, $5,000 ton Pinot in Monterey, and it, but it's a riper, lusher style. And so I found myself picking later, uh, having guys crop down in order to get the style that I wanted to, to make. And so I think you're gonna find our Pinots are a little different even today than some of the other Oregon Pinots. They're fleshier, um, they tend to be have a little bit more alcohol, a little bit more body. It's just my own particular preference. Um, but there are a lot of great Oregon producers uh, now. And uh, I mean, Domaine Serene, I remember their, their Chardonnay when I tasted it was, was amazing. Because um, we I came from a Chard house, Bernardus, we made 30,000 cases of high-end Chardonnay. And uh, so they were, they were kind of hitting the mark and I think that I, I love their wines as well. And now there's a lot of great producers um, and more coming on. Our weather is definitely improving. I mean, I, when I first moved up here with that fruit from Paso, I made a, a red blend. And I did my second one as a blend of Syrah and Pinot. And I said, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep this blend that I call Avante, I just kind of made up the name. I'm gonna do it in warm years. And so I did it in four, and I did it in five, I did it in six, I did it in nine, and then I did it in 12. And I've done it every year since 12. I've been able to get all of those 
big red wines, petite Syrah, Cap, whatever I put into the blend, and it's different every year, ripe and delicious. Mm -hmm. So we're definitely, I'm seeing global warming. Um, but then you have a year like this year where it rains all the way to the end of June, and we're going a month late, and we're going to be picking in November. So again, you know, Oregon does that to you, and it's okay. I, I don't mind it. So I'm curious about your experience in Sylvan Ridge. Obviously, you mentioned you were in a variety of roles there. Uh, first spot, first work in Oregon. So yep. tell me about how that compared to places you'd been before. It was quite similar. Um, I mean, we used a lot of the same equipment. It was really easy for me to kind of get in and just hit the ground running. And I enjoyed it. I, the owner really kind of was very hands off. I mean, I, as a winemaker there, I talked to her once a month if I initiated the call. I mean, she, you know, apparently I was doing a good job running the place because she didn't feel the need to kind of come in and do stuff. And so it was, uh, it was a great place to work. It was close to town. Um, in uh, Carmel, I mean, we were an hour from anything. When, when a pump goes down or whatever, I mean, it took, you know, half a day to go get your stuff. And right here on West Eugene, I mean, there's everything there, machinists, you know. Um, so I just have everything built, constructed, uh, repaired. It was, it was lovely. I loved working there. Um, they did a big variety of wines too, and you know they had Cab and Syrah. And they did a sparkling Muscat and, and a really big variety. I, I love the variety. I know it's, you know, I kind of lack focus in, in that regard, you know, <laughs> to make 30 wines. But I just, I, I love the variety. I have a friend. Uh, and he's, you know, he's worked for some wineries down in like Edna Valley and, and some of these in California. And then he worked up at St. Michelle in Washington and then um, Ben Lane here. And, you know, he made Pinot and Chardonnay, maybe Pinot Blanc, you know. And for me, that's like painting the colors red and blue only. I mean, I'm like, there's so much more, you know. And so I, I agree, 30 is excessive, you know. I, I was talking to a lady yesterday, a glass flyer. She, she laughed at me when I told her that I made 30 wines. And I'm like, I know, <laughs> you know. It's not a, that's the best business model. You know, you want to ideally make four wines in big quantities, you know, you achieve economies of scale and, you know, it's easy for the distributors to focus because you give them 30 wines and they go cross-eyed. And so I don't give them all my wines, but my wine club members and my customers, they love the variety. They love to be able to taste these things. I mean, you can be, as a wine club member here, you can get a different wine, you know, for three years. You'll never get the same wine. And so people love that. When it comes to the to working with all those different varietals, do you find how different do you find your kind of style and winemaking practice have to be? And are you are you learning new techniques along the way for the different kind of grapes you're working with? I generally like to let the grape kind of express its kind of own typicity. You know, um, you know, Cabernet has kind of a uh, can have a, a bell pepper character to it, and 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 Cab Franc even to a greater degree. Um, Albarino has this lovely kind of sometimes grapefruity citrus during fermentation and then it kind of transitions to tangerine and blood orange and I really kind of let those um, kind of showcase themselves. However, that being said, I always look for balance in the bottle and so I don't want, you know, it, 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 you have to balance um, alcohol and residual sugar with acid and tannin and when they're balanced the wine is amazing but if one of those things is too high, you know, it's like the tuba player that's playing too loud. That's all you hear is the tuba player. And it's funny because people come into the taste room and they'll taste our wines and they tell me over and over again, I go to wineries all the time and I can generally find, you know, one or two wines that I like. But I like every single wine here. How do you do that? And it's all about balance. It's about just getting it right. So I don't try to manipulate stuff too much. Um, all of the whites are done in stainless steel. I don't, you know, put those in oak because they don't need it. They've already got the aroma. Chardonnay doesn't have a lot of aroma coming in, so I barrel ferment it, you know? Um, but to do that with the Viognier is something that's perfumey. It's like, you know, a woman going out and buying a, like a little black dress and throwing a trench coat on top of it. I mean, you're just smothering it in just toasty oak and you really want the pretty, you know, to kind of come out. And so I, I let the whites stay pretty, you know? Chardonnay needs it. But I, even the, the reds, I don't over oak them. I try not to. I, I want you to get the texture of the oak and the feel but I don't want it to taste like you threw an old stool in the thing, you know? So it, again, it's balance. It's just harmony and, and that's the goal. And don't always hit it. I told the wine enthusiast right around time, I, I swing for the fences with every wine, you know? Sometimes you get a home run, sometimes you only get a double, but you know, I try with every one to make it amazing. And So tell me about starting your own project. You mentioned you started at Wall at Sylvan Ridge. Uh, when you started it, what, what did you have in mind for what it would eventually become, and, and how has how have you kind of has that been what it's become? Have you fall, found that goal? I think we have. I mean, I didn't really know starting in. I just I kind of wanted to have 
I want to make some wines that we didn't do at the other wineries. I think that's how winemakers get into it. You know, if you're, you're making Pinot all day long, you know, you want to make some Syrah or something, or you have a desire to make a pretty white. And so, again, it keeps you kind of engaged. And I think winery owners and, and things let winemakers do those things because they want you to stay engaged and they want you to continue learning. And you do learn stuff from, from everything. And so I think it's important to constantly keep reaching out there. It's like, you know, if you only made spaghetti and meatballs every day, you know, that would just be boring. You know, let's mix it up, make some piccata or something, you know. And so I think that's what I, I like to do. And, um, where was I going? I'm sorry, I lost it. I lost my train of thought there. Oh, uh, just start starting your own brand. And oh yeah. So um, I just I was going to start small and kind of let demand kind of take it. Um, the wine business is is unusual. It's almost like um, a public utility. Uh, it generally takes about a dollar ten in revenue to generate a dollar in sales. So that's kind of a losing proposition. That kind of goes back to the generational thing, because you buy all this equipment. You know, you know my press was fifty thousand dollars. I could use it six weeks a year, and the rest of the time it just collects dust. So you have to buy all this stuff, um, and it's very expensive. You don't use it. And wine, wine, you know, takes two to three years to make. All of my big reds spent two years in a thousand dollar French oak barrel. Okay, the, the entire time it's evaporating and you're losing volume. Okay, and you're spending time topping it and maintaining it. And then you have to buy, buy some glass and then you bottle it. And then it sits in the warehouse that you have to pay rent on while you're waiting to sell it. I mean, could you imagine if General Motors had to buy every single part for three or four years worth of cars, you know, and then make all those cars and then they just sit? No, they'd be out of business, you know? So it's, it's a really challenging business in that respect. Mm -hmm. So really your white ones, you, you can get those in and get them out early. Those are your cash flow. And those kind of help you make your red wines, which, you know, try to send you to the poorhouse. But I, I, I enjoy it. I love the process. I love, you know, being my own boss. And, you know, I mean, I get to work seven days a week. Lucky guy. <laughs> <laughs> but I do get to, you know, I do take a lot of vacation, um, you know, uh, to kind of mix it up. Um, this is a new thing that we've just recently done. We had just, you know, our, our winery in, in West Eugene is nothing fancy. It's just an old warehouse, you know. But it, it had initially been a distillery at one point and then a stevia plant. And so it was already set up for fruit production. I just had to put some floor drains in. But it made it easy from that respect with the city. Whereas this was a change of use because it was a furniture store. This was a lot, you know, a lot of permits, a lot of change of use, a lot of finagling with the city to be able to kind of get in and do it. Um, but I think it turned out well. And I did a lot of the work. I mean, I had, we put in a kitchen in back, um, this entire bar. I mean, I had to trench the entire thing out. You can't get a, we couldn't get a man, uh, automatic trencher in here. So me and this uh, gal, we dug ditches three feet deep in the entire thing. This, there was five feet of dirt the entire length of this bar and it was clay. So you couldn't reuse the clay because it won't compact again. So then I had to haul it out one wheelbarrow at a time down the street to a dump trailer, made about five or six loads in a dump trailer. And then we had to do the same thing and haul the pea gravel back in to refill the plumbing. It was, yeah, we had scaffolds here to bring in concrete because we could, didn't want to use a pump truck. We didn't want to damage the $10,000 countertop over there. So we had to bring wheelbarrow loads in one at a time. We had like 12 guys just as fast as we could bring wheelbarrows <laughs> dumping concrete in this place. So, um, but it's, it's, it's light. It, it's, the light's beautiful. It's great having a kitchen to pair some food with your wines. People love the space. I mean, it's just, it, it feels good. And so it, it's been nice. It's been kind of a, a highlight of the, the process. What made you decide it was the time to do it? It's funny because actually when I was at Silver Ridge years ago, this little section here was for lease. There used to be a wall here. And I, I'm like, that's a cute little thing. I could do a little tasting bar. It's kind of cool because you could set tables up here and kind of look out the window and we'll put a little staircase. And I talked to the plumber. He's like, it's going to be about six grand to get plumbing to you, you know, because it's over from the bathrooms over here. I'm like, six grand. And I was like, we were still only making a couple hundred cases. I'm like, I don't think I'm ready for that, you know? And so I let it go. And so then Modern took it over. Now they had the entire space. And one of my guys who was working for me uh, at the tasting room, he's actually uh, the director of the Lane Arts Council, but he loves wine and he would come in um, pour on the weekends, saw the space for sale, for lease. And he says, you should go check that out. Uh, so I went and talked to him and walked in here and I was like, yep, got to do it. It's a lot of money, but I think we're ready. And so we did it. And my intent was to keep the winery open Fridays and Saturdays, which we were currently doing, and then open this place on the west side to capture people over here in town that didn't want to go to the West Eugene. And then COVID hit, and then we closed that place over there, never reopened it, and so now it's just all here. So, but it's a good space. 
as you were starting your brand and you mentioned you kind of it was kind of you wanted to do a little bit of everything you wanted to find all this. tell me about finding grapes tell me about finding vineyards and, and people to work with and starting to kind of build your portfolio of, of all these different kinds of wines sometimes it's just I, I drive around a lot you know and because I sort I was sourcing fruit from Sofen Ridge and they got a lot of stuff from the Rogue Valley um, all the way through the Willamette Valley and so I was on the road sourcing grapes for them and visiting vineyards and so Sometimes I would use the same growers, you know, Del Rio Vineyards. He has a huge vineyard with lots of variety. And so, so my first Syrah I got from him, he has this block 13 that's just full of these giant cobbles, you know, and it's just like, you're, it's like you're being, you're in France. You're like, wow, I have to have that. It's sandy, it's well-drained, and the wines are amazing. You know, Panerash used to pull from that block. I mean, really top quality fruit. But you'll see vineyards, and I'll just, I mean, I'll stick my business card in a mailbox and say, hey, you know, I'd like to check out your vineyard. Sometimes I'll just look on Wine Business Monthly and they'll say there's fruit for sale and I'll go out and visit them. And sometimes it's overgrown with blackberries and poison oak, and other times it's meticulously farmed. And so I look at the aspect, I look at the angle to the sun, I look at the soils, the elevation, um, and then I just, sometimes I'll just buy a ton or two and just work with it. And if I like it, then I keep going. And I've had relationships now that go back almost 20 years from just people I met just randomly driving by their place or, you know, mm -hmm. get introduced to them. But I, I still keep finding new places. It's new places, new vineyards. Um, yeah. Last year, I got, I, there was a, a, a winery that had gone into, the owner had something fraud or something. He's in prison about something. But it was in a receivership. And they had all these crazy little weird varietals. You know, Pinot Meunier, and they had Semillon, and a little Viognier, and Gamay, and just all these odds and ends. And I, I bought the entire thing from the bank, <laughs> you know? And it was great. And I made a lot of them as single vineyard stuff. I mean, and they're beautiful wines, you know, out of Roseburg, you know? And they ended up selling the thing, and all that stuff got ripped out. You know, some Shannon, we'll, we'll never get it again. But they were, it was just a really nice kind of thing to do, you know? Just an opportunity to work with things that you don't get to see very often. And our club members love it, you know. I mean, Pinot Meunier is often, a, it's a blending grape in Champagne. Nobody makes it as a red wine, but we made it as a red wine. It's a lighter red wine, but it's just, it's a great little summer red. I, I'm really enjoying it. I'm glad we did it on its own and didn't blend it away into obscurity. So you have a nice, you mentioned earlier that you, the business background, getting into, the, getting into wine is nice to have a business background. Tell me about the specific business. Um, what was the kind of the timeline for growth and, and how, has, how, has, how has that gone? So we finished construction. Uh, we took the lease in this place in June of 2019. By March of 2020, we were ready to open and COVID hit. And they're like, you can't open. We're like, fantastic. And the bank's like, I want my money. And I'm like, fantastic. <laughs> so we actually um, had this roll up door that we put in and we set up some additional tables here so we had our six foot social distancing and we rolled this up and we tasted people through the door so they could come pick up they could drive up they could taste they could buy their wines and so we actually did sell some wines out of here even during that um, but it's gotten better ever since you know 2020 was kind of up and down you're open you're closed you're open you're closed um, for us it wasn't super terrible because we had wine we have a kitchen here, but we didn't have a lot of food. But I had, I had no people in Portland restaurants, you know. They got all scaled up. They loaded up the refrigerators just to have the governor say, oh, you're closed again. And they had to throw all that stuff out. And so I, I don't blame any of those guys for not opening again. That whole open-close thing is, was really painful. Um, I mean, I wish they would have just given us all PPE and said, you know, protect yourselves. You know, if you want to stay home, stay home. If you want to go out, you need to wear this. And, we, you know, employees wear it, customers wear it. But I think it was really hurt our economy to shut business down. I don't think that's the solution ever. I think there's, you know, protective measures. We all need that, you know. I mean, I mean, there's other things that go around, the flu and whatever, and you just have to, I, I felt like that was a mistake. But we, we made our way through it. Um, we took kind of a hit in sales. I was planning on breaking a million dollars in 2020 and didn't. We went back a couple hundred thousand, and um, but our labor was down because we had to lay everybody off because we're not open. and. Um, but we came roaring back in 2021 and did almost a million and one. And so, you know, we got back to where we wanted to be, and it's still growing. This particular thing is, it's, it's kind of a full service deal. You know, we're, we're waiting on people and doing food stuff. And so you have to, you have to run it almost like a restaurant. And you have to be, pay attention to your, to your labor costs because they can get crazy. Over there, it was self-service. You know, we had one person, maybe two on a busy night. People come up to the bar, get their wine, go sit down. It was more of kind of like a, you come in and serve yourself. And this is more of, hey, you know, we're going to bring you wine. We're going to bring you flights. We're going to bring you food. 
so you need more staff, you know. And in the kitchen, you got cooking staff. You got to have food. But I think that you know, having food, people, you know, they'll have maybe a second glass of wine, or, or you know, the people come here for lunch. I mean, I've had people come in, and every single person orders the flatbread. So it's you know. It help, I think it heightens the experience of wine. When you can have food with it, it's really nice. I can't, you know, I have one glass of wine, I'm done. I'm like, you know, I, if I don't have something to eat, I'm like, <laughs> you know, I, I can't drive where I'm going. I'm, so <laughs> I think if you can give them a little something in their stomach, it's, it's, it's a good thing. Safe service. I had a question in my head and I just lost it. You know, that happens. I, you know, that happens. I do. <laughs> oh, the other part of 2020. Um, tell me about 2020 Harvest. 2020 Harvest was, we had fires uh, in 2020. So I was, 2020 started out great. My wife and I, we took this trip to, um, it was a, a uh, she's a veterinarian, and it was a business um, seminar in San Antonio. And we went, and I wasn't a part of it. It was more of a, it was called Veterinary Growth Partners. It was to teach her kind of about her business and help her grow it. But they let me sit in on the thing. And there was a lot of parallels between the wineries and the veterinarians and just of managing people and staff and, you know, all this stuff. And they let me do the entire thing. We had a great time. And I got to taste a lot of wines from San Antonio, some Viognier's and some great stuff from the Texas Hill Country. So really had a great time. My wife turned 50. We booked a cruise. We left the 29th, which was leap year. We got back on the 6th or 7th of March, right before they stopped letting people off cruise ships. So we had a great time in the Caribbean, you know, and it was just an absolute blast. And then we came back to COVID, you know, and I was, I was, the SIP wine festival was going on usually in March. I was all excited. There's a Cannon Beach wine walk. Well, they canceled SIP. I was like, oh. And then, but I still went to Cannon Beach. I drove all the way to Cannon Beach. They let us be open the first night, and then they closed us down the second night. 11.30, they said, pack up, go home. Governor won't let us stay open. I'm like, okay. And so it was frustrating to me, but we really tried to just kind of, like I said, stay positive. You know, we'd take hikes at Spencer Butte, and uh, we have a little condo in Ben, so we'd go over there. And so there wasn't much going on, so we'd have a picnic in the park. We'd go get a couple beers and sandwiches and, you know, eat and bend and go ride our bikes. And it seemed like every time we went to the coast or to Bend, the restaurants were open because it was county by county. So mm -hmm. I couldn't go out to eat here in Eugene, but I could go out to eat over there. So we'd go over there and we'd go out to eat. And so we actually kind of, you know, it wasn't terrible. Um, and a friend of mine, we like to sail a lot. I, I race out at Fern Ridge, but a buddy of mine, um, we go charter sailboats and we go cruise in different parts of the world. He's like, let's go to Turkey. And I'm like, okay, let's go to Turkey. My wife's like, we're not going to Turkey, you know? I'm like, yes, we are. We're going to go sail in Turkey for two and a half weeks. So we left in like end of August, end of August for the first two weeks in September. And we... Uh, flew from Eugene to San Francisco, and my buddy just, he sold his company here, and he used to sell helicopter uh, repair parts and stuff like that, and tools, and sold them worldwide, you know? And so he has, um, he had millions of travel miles. So we upgraded us all to business class. So we flew nonstop from San Francisco to Istanbul, Turkey, business class. We woke up, I mean, full lay down beds. We, you know, we woke up in the morning and we had our own little toothbrushes, our own little <laughs> private bathrooms, you know, we're like, we're here, you know? And so we went and flew to Fethiye, Turkey, and it is beautiful. It's like Greece with trees. I mean, down to the water, 40 degree visibility of the water, amazing food. We went to this place called Pamukkale where these, you know, calcite warm jacuzzi to, you know, were kind of overflowing. You could walk through the pools. We took a hot air balloon ride up and over there. And then we went sailing for two and a half weeks. The harbors were completely full. They put these little crosses along all of the shorelines. And there's all these little islands along the shorelines. And everybody was out there. Everybody from Russia to Germany to England was all working from home on their boats. <laughs> and so it was just a zoo. But you come up to these little restaurants. They have a little dock. And they let you back your boat up to the dock. They don't charge you any money to go there. You just have to have dinner. But you can have dinner anyways, you know? So you go have dinner. You have a great time. They have bathrooms and stuff there. And then you just get in your boat. You grab a loaf of bread in the morning for two bucks or two lira. And you head out and you go again. So but the end of our trip, my daughter starts sending me these pictures. Armageddon, you know, there's like, it looks like your planet Mars. Everything's red, there's ash, there's fire. And we're just, she was like, we have like five cats because my wife has all these rescues. My daughter had like all the cages lined up. She had the family photo albums and she's 17 and she was freaking out. You know, one night she just watched a scary movie with her kid, with her friends. And just as her friends left at one o'clock in the morning, the power went out. So then she can't see anything. So she was, she was freaking, we were freaking out for her. And then we couldn't fly back to Eugene because the fires were too bad. So we ended up routing to San Francisco, then had to go to Portland, somehow made it back here. But got back, ash this thick at the winery. I could not believe it. Um, it was it was atrocious, and 
everybody was worried about smoke taint. Um, I had one grower who sells a bunch of wine to King of State. They, 80 tons. They basically walked away. They're like, we're not taking this. Um, and so I said, Jim, and I'd known this guy for years. I started working with Sylvan Ridge. I said, Jim, I'll do my best to help you do it. I could probably bring in half. Turns out we ended up bringing in the whole 80 tons. I bought an extra tank from Sylvan Ridge. I bought a bunch of extra transport tanks. We brought the entire thing in, and I really established a protocol to minimize the smoke incursion, and we ended up selling 10,000 gallons day to Z. You know, we made a good wine out of it. We made some rosé, we made some white pinot. The white pinot is in our Blanc de Noir, and I don't get any smoke in it. We've made through all of the 2020 whites, none. So I was really pressing very, very gently, minimizing skin contact, short maceration times, and we made some fantastic wines in 2020. I had one hard press, barrel of Sauvignon Blanc that was smoky that I'm, I'm, I'm sending to the distiller because I don't care. But um, I don't know, somehow we dodged a bullet, but it was just, you know, it was, that was a very, very challenging harvest year. Um, but great wines, I'm, you know, none of the reds have it. Um, and I, you know, I wasn't really worried about the whites because I was, like I said, I squeezed pretty gently to not get any of that in there. Um, the reds, because the skins are in contact with the liquid as they're fermenting, that's where your risk runs in. Um, but we, like I said, I didn't, I didn't cold soak any Pinot that year. It came in, it got crushed, it got fermented hot and fast. I had twice as much yeast, and everything was done in five days. We drained it, pressed it, and got it out of there. You know, often I would soak things, you know, for a while to get color, and you know, and you just have to, you have to change your technique up depending on what Mother Nature's given you. And I'm hoping she doesn't give us any more this year. <laughs> How did you feel that the industry in general handled 2020, especially that, especially that harvest? Everybody's freaking out. I, I buy a lot of fruit from Medford, and Medford always has fires, and the smoke tends to kind of accumulate down there, you know? Um, it's actually canceled the Shakespeare Festival a couple of times because it gets so bad. So I actually dealt with fire every year down there. I mean, one year, I mean, it was like, you couldn't even see a quarter mile in front of you. There's so much smoke in Medford, you know? And the, in 2020, I mean, like, I can see all across the valley. I'm like, guys, this isn't bad. I mean, I've been, this has been way worse. And so people up here were going, they were freaking. I mean, like, you know, so many people didn't make wine or whatever, um, which is the reason I think why fruit was in such demand in 2021, because all those guys that skipped it needed stuff. So all of the white wines you used to be able to get easily, you know, prices went up and everybody was, everybody was getting it. So it was definitely challenging going forward to buy fruit if you don't have your own vineyard, which I don't. And so I was getting out-competed for a lot of stuff. And uh, so I have to pivot and, you know, I had to go to Washington for a number of things. Sylvia Blanc out of Washington, ended up getting cab out of Washington because I couldn't get any. Um, so, but I'm okay with any, you know, anywhere in the Northwest, you know. Mm -hmm. I like to keep it Oregon. It's a shorter drive for me to go haul it or test it or whatever, but um, Washington's a good place to grow grapes as well, uh, so. You mentioned this year and the challenges of it. Uh, what have you found? Uh, do you have a, an analogy for this year compared to previous years, or is this going to be a kind of a unique challenge for, for making? It reminds me a bit of 2011 or 2007, one of those cooler years where it just kind of the, the temperature stays low. Um, the challenge this year was that it's, it was kind of mild going up through April, March. We're all like, yeah, it's going to be early spring and get all excited because it's been kind of that, that trend uh, the past few years. Yeah. And what happened was is we had bud break in, in a lot of spots. And then we got frost. I had a grower send me a picture in Washington of his grape canes just covered in a sheet of ice, you know. Uh, and that happened a lot in the Willamette Valley. And initially, growers were saying, oh, it was just a little bit. If you were down low, you know, where it's warmer. You had bud break, and so then the frost got those guys, but the upper guys hadn't started to push yet. And then the more I start talking to people, the more it's more widespread. So I think yields are going to be down this year, and uh, which is good because if we're going to have a late harvest, you can get definitely get it right by having a smaller yield as opposed to having a big yield and trying to get it ripe, which was uh, more like 2011. But I think we're going to be picking in the Willamette Valley end of October and into November this year. It's going to be one of those deals. And as long as we don't get frost, that's great. Um, we can do that. But that's, you, you know, those fall frosts are another thing to worry about too. Because once you fry your leaves, all your sugar factory's gone, you know. And then you're going to cash and carry or Costco. <laughs> so. You talked earlier about your kind of initial impressions of the Oregon industry. Uh, what has changed since you've been here? What, what does the industry look like now compared to when you got here? It's becoming a little more um, 
mature. When I first got here, I mean, it was a lot of like mom and pop growers. You know, these people with, you know, 20 acres, 40 acres, um, kind of learning how to grow stuff on their own. You know, whereas in California, I mean, it's professionally managed. They send crews through to drop second crop, and you know, it's all very professionally done. This has a wide variability in canopy management and irrigation strategy and just you know it was kind of the wild west mm -hmm. and i'm starting to see a little bit more maturity now in terms of how people are doing things we're actually seeing um you know corporate people coming in kj's come in and purchase a number of wineries and so you know they're realizing that hey <laughs> it's a pretty fantastic area to go grapes and you know you can still get it for you know less than a hundred thousand dollars an acre which is you know napa's two hundred thousand you know for years it was thirty thousand up here you know i'm sure it's more now um, probably more like 60 or 70 but it's a value and the the weather's good, you get irrigation from Mother Nature. We do have some fires, but it hasn't been as bad as California has. They're getting them worse and worse every year, and their water's getting worse and worse every year, and they're get, that's the real problem, I think, is the water. Um, so I think we're gonna see a lot more influx up here. I'm surprised we haven't seen Galler and, and some of those big guys come in here, because they're, they're big property owners and stuff down there, and I mean, they could come in here and buy the whole place, because they've got a lot of money and, you know they need the grapes. So mm -hmm. that's, that, that worries me because I don't have vineyards and I don't know that I necessarily want to get into the vineyard business, you know? I'm probably within 10 years of retirement and I just, I think I want to just make wine, so. Well, so what do you see coming next in Oregon wine then? I'd like to see some more recognition for some, some of the Rhone stuff. I mean, uh, and just on, on a broader scale. Uh, I mean, Viognier grown in Oregon is amazing. I love Grenache, and so there's stunning Syrahs out there, I think. You know, we did Roussan for many years, um, and, and even Cabs. I mean, you know, like I said, Cab is just not on anybody's radar, and Cab is still king, and it's, it's our most expensive wine, and people buy it like crazy. So I think we're going to start seeing a, a shift in, in, in focus, you know. It might get too warm for Pinot, you know, when you have these really hot days, and, and so maybe it's going to be a transition to more kind of Rhone varietals, and then possibly cab in the warmer spots. So I think we'll see more varieties popping up in more areas and hopefully better national recognition for some of the other things besides Noir and Gris and Chard. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. What about what comes next for you? What's, uh, what's kind of on your horizon? I am really kind of, I feel good. I feel like I've gotten to a spot where I'm happy. My kids are, my youngest daughter graduated in 2020, so she's in college. I got two kids in college. And so now I'm really just all about kind of traveling. I mean, we're, we're going sailing again here at the end of August. We're going to go to Italy. And um, we've already, we were in Mexico a couple weeks ago and the big island. And so I'm trying to just enjoy life. My wife just sold her company. And so we're like, we're kind of have retirement on the brain, but I don't want to retire because I love doing this. In fact, when I went into the wine business and part of being an owner is that I wanted to work as long as I wanted to work, you know, and maybe just work a little bit less, maybe golf a little bit more, but still kind of come in and do stuff. I love coming in here and meeting our customers and talking with them. Next week at the World Games, I'm going to be here every single day, making sure everybody's having a great experience, making sure the staff doesn't get overwhelmed. And I love the customer service part of it. Um, so um, it's hard for me because I, I love the winemaking. It's, it's almost two full-time jobs. I can't be everywhere at once, and it's like I'm trying to split my time really can be exhausting. but. I'm just, I'm really kind of enjoying life now. I'm just trying to, you know, ride my bike more and just kind of enjoy the fruits of our labor. My wife, she, you know, she worked for 26 years building her practice up. She started her own mobile veterinary practice here and grew it to, you know, a million four and sold it to a company in Boston. So we're just, you know, wanted to kind of see the world and, you know, well, you can. My, I met a guy when I was at Bernardis. He, he was our maintenance guy. He was an older guy. And he had this old gas station in Carmel Valley Village, and then he came to do maintenance for us. And he was a smart guy. He said, I'm going to give you a piece of advice. He says, don't wait till your retirement to do the things you want to do. Do them now. Because when you're retired, you're going to be tired, and you're going to be old, and things aren't going to work, and you can't climb the pyramids, and all this stuff. He says, go now, because you never know when your number's up. And so from that point on, I've always been kind of doing this. And coming to Oregon, you know, I, I love living in California, the weather's nice, but I was always house poor, you know? Always trying to keep up with the Joneses. Moved up here, got our house was twice, twice as big on five acres of property. You know, our kids went to Hawaii for, you know, every year for, you know, forever. We, we took them to Europe, we took them to Mexico, we took them to Canada, we, we vacationed a lot. And so I've just tried to always enjoy life every day because you never know when your number's up. And so that's it, I'm just burning it at both ends. <laughs> so. 
Uh, in terms of the winemaking, you mentioned obviously you make a lot of different things. Is there something that you want to do that you haven't done yet? Is there a varietal you want to tackle or a blend you want to make that you haven't tried yet? There's not a lot of Italian varietals being made in Oregon. Uh, I made some Paso Robles Barbera one time that was just stunning. Um, and so I wouldn't mind doing some Barbera, or some Sangio, or some Nebbiolo. I think there's some smaller plantings going in Medford, maybe some in Washington. And uh, I, I like those varietals, and I think they're unique. And you know, again, I like to show my customers something new, kind of get them out of their comfort zone. You know, you know, they always come in, they're like, I want a Chardonnay. I'm like, No, you don't. Let's try try this. You know, and so I give them something else. And so um, people are always, wine's weird because people, are, you know, a lot of people are intimidated by it. You know, in terms of ordering it or whatever. And so I always just try and throw something at them that I, you know, just to have them try it and give them an eye-opening experience. And so that's part of the reason I make a lot of wines is that it's just, there's a lot to know, you know. And I like variety. Uh, on that note, you mentioned uh, customer base here. Tell me how the Eugene kind of wine scene has, has evolved while you've been here. What are your customers like now? Uh, and uh, sort of what, what are they looking for as the next thing here? Well, I started my winery in West Eugene um, because I really, uh, after working out in the country, I loved, I worked in the country in both places and, and you know, in California and here, I love the idea of city water, you know? I mean, some of the stuff that we pulled out of the wells out in the country, I mean, it's gray and bubbly and smells like volcanic rotten eggs, you know? I mean, it's tough. You think Oregon, oh, we get all this water and it rains a lot, but it's a very volcanic environment, you know? And we have them, we're surrounded by them. And the water can be crazy. Our, our pediatrician lived up the street from us. I remember they had us for dinner one night and I could not drink the coffee because it was so salty, you know? Our water is beautiful, it's sweet. We've got three little, uh, uh, um, what am I trying to say, springs, you know, um, on the property. And so our water is fantastic, but being able to come in and have city water, it takes a lot of water to make wine. So to have good city water, city sewage, you don't have to red septic, um, it was a really nice thing for me. So my winery was an urban thing and it was kind of an interesting deal. You know, not a lot of places were doing it. A few were popping up in San Francisco, but it was really practical, you know? It's like you can order Chinese food at harvest, you know, and order pizzas and it's warmer and lighter. I mean, I can I see the target sign from my work, you know? And so I just, you feel like, you know, when it's late at night, you don't feel so weird because, you know, like I said, you see target sign. When you're out in the country, it's dark and it's cold and it's, you're raining and you're crushing fruit out there and it's just, you're covered in your slickers and it's just, it can be kind of miserable. And this just feels a little more civilized. Um, and that scene has really kind of blossomed, you know, Capitello wineries down the way. You know, Ray makes fantastic wines. He's doing some stuff for Territorial. At one point I actually was looking into buying the building in Territorial because I, I really love the whole urban winery thing. And it's it's cool. And now there's distilleries popping in and Ale Song Brewing. And I had some friends up from Los Angeles and you know, we did a little pub crawl, you know. Before I was here, you know, we went to Cold Fire and then we went to Marche and then we went to Steelhead and Tap and Growler. And so, get a drink, get a snack, and just kind of at each different place, and it's, you know, it's fun. And, and that's kind of what's going on now here. Now we've got three big hotels and lots of restaurants and places to eat and places to sip, and it's got a really good vibe. And I think the, the wine scene's really kind of happening in South Lima Valley, you know. We were always kind of a weird kind of uh, stepchild, everybody in, in, up in the Portland area, that we're, we're Southern Oregon, and Southern Oregon guys know you're Willamette Valley, and so, you know, it was like, we're just like, whatever, <laughs> we're just Eugene, <laughs> so, but we're getting some respect now. All right, so the questions that I have for you, uh, anything I didn't ask that I should have, anything we didn't cover that you would have I liked think to we cover? covered the whole gamut, so that was fantastic. Good, excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time, for your candor, for hospitality in this amazing space, and Absolutely. go ahead and let you off the hook. Appreciate it. Thank you.